Uh, today, we are really privileged to have with us the esteemed speakers, respected Honorable Justice Kurian Joseph, Mr. Mohit Mathur, Ms. Rebecca John, and Dr. Nagaratna. I wholeheartedly welcome all of you. I also welcome all the participants on behalf of Neve Judicial Education. Neve was established in 2016 as an institution to provide the wholehearted guidance and support to the law students to crack all the competitive law examinations. These, ladies and gentlemen, our speakers scarcely needs any introduction, so I'll keep it very brief. Honorable Justice Kurian Joseph is a retired judge the, from the Supreme Court of India, known for his human and compassionate approach to law. He is one of the 10 judges in the history of the Supreme Court of India who has delivered more than 1,000 judgments. He has authored leading judgment for Constitution Bench striking down the practice of triple talaq. In the case of Chandulal Verma versus State of Chhattisgarh 2018, it was Justice Joseph who, while commenting the death sentence of the applicant to life imprisonment, stated that how public discourse and crime have an impact on trial, conviction, and sentence in the cases. Mr. Mohit Mathur is a senior advocate, High Court of Delhi, and is a president of Delhi High Court Bar Association. He has been the leading counsel in Ravi Khan Sharma case, the famous BMW case, Shubhas Gupta triple murder case, and so on. Ms. Rebecca Joan is a senior advocate, High Court of Delhi. She has been leading counsel in Harshad Mehta scam case, Hawala scam case, and Arushi Talwar case. Dr. Nagaratna is an associate professor, criminal law, and chief coordinator, cyber law, National Law School of India University, Bangalore. And with this, I would like to invite Senior Advocate Mr. Mohit Mathur to share with us his words of wisdom. Mr. Mathur. Hi, Mathur. Good, Good evening. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Sir, it's been a pleasure now, sir, seeing you after such a long time. <laughs> Personally, equally mine too. Yeah. Uh, Honorable Justice Korean Joseph, Rebecca John, Senior Advocate. In fact, uh, Rebecca has been my mentor right from my law school days, sir. From my very first day of the law college, I have, in fact, uh, passed all my exams from her notes. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Nagaratna, <laughs> Professor, National Law University, Bangalore. All persons attending, thank you for tuning in. Good evening, everyone. I thank you all, especially the organizers, for having me join this distinguished panel of the aces of this profession as we speak on the impact of public discourse on fair trial in criminal cases. I, as any other counsel, am no stranger to this concept, having witnessed such influence firsthand during cases, and I must concede at the outset that the cause of subject phenomena lies in the fact that we are all humans, and therefore, subject to the limitations of our perspectives, which inevitably get swayed by the vox populi, it is entirely natural for people of a particular place to develop a collective con conscience, which is constantly reshaped by discourse, media, and other factors. Not necessary that the projection of the cases in media or public domain is entire truth or material admissible for trial. But when we cannot turn the clock back, why create an environment which is insurmountable for any individual and he fails to defend himself or establish his case because he is trolled or an impression is created in the media where he loses out without even entering the fight. However, I feel we councils also have a solemn duty to ensure that the justice delivery mechanism is free from bias and sensationalism, though it is certainly in vogue these days. As members of the bar, it is highly essential to detach oneself from any air surrounding a brief. For the purposes of today's lecture, we may treat public discourse as a factor for promoting some form of bias. The bias itself may be held by anyone, the councils, the judges, witnesses, or anyone for that matter. We councils ought to set an example of professional conduct by removing prejudices from our matters and ensuring that any discourse that may be taking place in the society 
does not reach the text of our pleadings or find mention in our arguments. I must candidly, however, apologize for sometimes I am myself a party to creating this bias when I appear for some colleagues as the president of the bar or as otherwise an office bearer. But most of the times, we defense counsels are always at the receiving end of these media trials with biases running high. Hard cases make bad law. Bias one way or another is never good as it prejudices one of the parties, either the accused or the prosecution. Our constitution, as we all know, has always guaranteed a fair trial. But media and now social media goes all out to put to poll all the points or arguments that are raised in any case. Thankfully, the cases on criminal side because of our system last longer than the human memories or the yearning of the human for any sensationalism in any particular case. And probably by the time the matter reaches its conclusive stages, that sensationalism is gone. It is although revived at the, just at the nick of the time when the conviction or the acquittal has to take place or when the sentencing is being discussed. I feel that these public discourses may be healthy, but after a point of time, they start affecting the counsels, the witnesses, the psyche of the accused, and even sometimes judicial psyche. Please pardon me, sir, when I say that. Because sir, they, are also they are also humans. <laughs> Sir, as, I, as you have rightly said, sir, courts are also presided by men. And many times, the public discourses on media affects them. I do not say it is deliberate, but many a times it comes naturally. And also, many a times, the trial courts, we find, also act on the fear of what would be said or commented. The first instance when this fear and this bias steps in as is the time when the person is arrested and produced before the court. And that is the point of time when the counsels have to address arguments for their bail. The very fact whether a person should be released on bail or not is affected by the last night discussions on the social media as well as the media trials and the discussions, whether a person deserves to be released on bail or not. Unfortunately, many a times, even the arguments that are likely to be taken are discussed in full length in these discussions and discourses. And the pros and cons are thrashed as if it's a trial being carried out in those social media platforms itself or in the media uh, chambers and their uh, halls. That affects the liberty of an individual which has to be preserved and must be preserved as enshrined in our constitution. Another factor this, uh, the discourses affect is the delay in getting the bail. And sometimes even the terms and conditions which should be imposed on him at the time of bail. The general rule of bail is given to a total go by and the councils are left at the mercy of the courts and the mercy of the public opinion, whether and how to address their arguments on bail. This kind of a situation is also a largely seen in cases where either it's a heinous offense or a large sum of money is involved or it is an offense or something which is affecting the public sentiment. And in the past few years, we have seen this kind of uh, discourses, how they affect where the man is held guilty even before the trial starts. He is condemned and this situation was uh, long back seen 
in a case of Uma Purana, uh, I'm sure uh, Rebecca and I would remember, she was a teacher and a sting operation was carried out by a media house. In that sting operation, they found and tried to portray that she was trafficking in the girls that she was teaching. That lady was not just arrested, harassed, in fact, beaten up on her way to the courts, only to be found by the investigating agencies that the sting itself was a fraud. And in a month's time, when the matter was really in the highlighted uh, area and realm, her family was condemned, she was condemned, all sorts of allegations were leveled out against that entire family. After a month to be told that the sting itself was done wrongly, the broadcaster was uh, condemned, the journalist was condemned, but you could not return back her dignity and her respect, which she was earning as a teacher. Now imagine this kind of a situation when it starts affecting the lives of people merely because of the public condemnation and the public trial, would it be called a fair trial for anyone for that matter? Similar situations have happened in the past, not just in India, but even otherwise outside India, one could easily recall the O.J. Simpson trial, where an unfortunate division had happened in the public opinion based on the racist lines. The African-Americans were all supporting O.J. Simpson, whereas the all white Americans were against it. Finally, he was acquitted, but in the tortious uh, suit, he was penalized. And similar is today the situation we see with the recent death of George Floyd. The same, same African-Americans are feeling that they have been basically harassed all their lives and therefore there is a division. And the police officer, I don't know whether he would ever get a fair trial because the way the public media and global, uh, the way it spread globally and the manner in which people have come out on the streets, there is a definite bias which is created. As a bar association, we also find this as a problem. And that's what I wanted to share my experiences, that as a bar association, we find that we have to sometimes, as office bearers, come before the court and try and create a situation where we say, when an hour, one of our colleagues is in the docks, that we have to come forward and defend him. At that point of time, we have to plead before the court that as a member of the bar, he will always be available. He will always try to uh, go by the rule of law. And at that point of time, as I apologized in the starting itself, that sometimes we have to create that environment that this bias is in our favor as an accused. At the same time, when a lawyer is wronged, the bar associations, I would not use the word gang up, but I would say definitely they collect together and they try to oppose the situation. And they oppose the bails, they oppose the process itself. And in the past, it's not unknown, situations had come to a head where the matter went up to the Supreme Court also. And in Tamil Nadu, one of the cases, the bar associations passed a resolution saying that nobody from the bar association, members of the bar association, would appear for such a person, for such an accused. And in that scenario, the accused was obviously at a disadvantage for not getting the right relief or the right legal opinions. Supreme Court in A.S. Muhammad Rafi's case ultimately said 
that it's his constitutional right under Article 22, and therefore you have to allow a counsel of his choice, which is his constitutional right. Now, counsel of his choice could it be could be from outside or from the same place, but definitely the bar associations are not expected to hijack the process in such a manner that an individual, any citizen for that matter, does not get legal relief. And that, I feel, has to be maintained by all bar associations. And as a member and office bearer of a bar association, I feel that when the list affects a member of the bar, or when somebody is opposing a member of the bar, we should not create any kind of a pressure because public discourse not only means the debates in the media, but even in our corridors, when we create that kind of an environment, even that is incorrect because that also prejudices any fair trial. And we have taken an oath of maintaining fairness in trial and professional conduct, uh, professional conduct to be maintained. Therefore, this definitely should be avoided in every manner whatsoever. As far as the biases are concerned, as I said, I have not been a stranger to such things myself. People would recall there was a triple murder case of personal point. Subhash Gupta was one of the accused persons in that. He was the only surviving accused out of the uh, four or five people who were kidnapped originally, and he was the accused along with the other. For a good five, six years, he did not get any kind of a relief till the time the matter he was convicted. And it was a strange conviction where the conspiracy could not be uh, proved, and therefore everyone else was acquitted and he was convicted alone. It ultimately took the high court and at the appeal stage where in a judgment by the division bench, Delhi high court acquitted him. And after a good uh, uh, 22 years of the ordeal, he suffered an ordeal for 22 years, though he was released on bail. But even after that, the conviction was a pure and simple conviction where it appeared that the learned trial judge had passed on the buck by saying, you get your acquittal from somewhere else. And he had convicted the person. The high court came to the conclusion that there is no evidence when you have ultimate. So these biases play a very, very wrong role. And unfortunately, in today's environment, there we find all sorts of new coinages of urban axolites in the media, a coinage comes in. The absconders is a concept where a person who is not trying to get his relief from the courts by without going into the uh, custody is declared an absconder without realizing the meaning of it. The wherever there is money involved, the siphoning of funds and this uh, enforcement directorate issues, the Prevention of Money Laundering Act, everyone is condemned and the social media starts the trial and the media starts the trial with probably everyone becoming an expert on law without any knowledge on the legal field. Supreme Court, and I'm sure, uh, with Justice Korean here, he would throw light on that aspect, had always said that the right of the media to comment or to discuss it is there because of their fundamental right of speech and expression. But that definitely should keep itself at a distance from commenting on the pending trials or pending matters because that affects an individual's liberty, which is paramount, according to me. And the Supreme Court, in several judgments, which I needn't comment here, have always said that the 
person deserves his fair trial and therefore the discussions and discourses should be restricted as a member of the bar i feel that the members of the bar who go and enter into such kind of discourses should also exercise some kind of a self imposed discipline in commenting on the merits of the matter because when they start commenting on the merits of the matter they start discussing the arguments they start discussing the law and many a times without being in the uh, know of the facts of the case they start commenting which is even more dangerous i would say that uh, we should not discourage the public from actively discussing or forming an informed consensus amongst themselves about the functioning of uh, the courts or a process or the development in any ongoing case since that's a part of the transparency which needs to be maintained and they should also be aware of the technicalities and the perplexities of law and irrespective of the outcome the people should be allowed to follow the developments to come to their own informed conclusions but there should not be a loose opinion making or a judgmental mannerism of the of the people who are in those discourses to start declaring their judgments and announcing their judgments on cases which are still pending after the case is over they may discuss it but i would still feel that it should be within the realm of a, a proper uh, propriety to discuss the matter and especially those who are uh, appearing on these uh, media uh, platforms on a daily basis or on a very regular basis without being counsels in the matter should uh, refrain from commenting because they are not knowing the entire case or their facts of the case and as a president of a high court bar i feel that the fraternity also owes a responsibility towards litigants ultimately they are the ones who access this temple of justice so if they are the ones who have to access the temple of justice their rights need to be protected so in light of whatever i have said i would uh, urge the younger members of my bar and those who are under training to develop a sense of detachment from bias and any notions that crop up or that prop up in the public uh, domain and in the and propagated in these discourses i believe we are a special class of citizens and it is our duty to be the torch bearers of this pursuit of truth our as i have already said only humans fall prey to preconceived notions and influences when dealing with these cases nevertheless i feel councils will benefit themselves as well as litigants if they can pursue their briefs sticking to the material forming official record of the case i must add that members of the bar are responsible for protecting each other from any negative perceptions surrounding certain briefs they ought to be con constant reminders to all councils that they serve only as officers of the court and not thekedars of the public healthy and informed public discourses are indicative of any developing or a good democracy but i only pray that this discourses are limited to affecting us positively which can be used to highlight the plight of victims who are not being given the redress but not to harm any individual for that matter our constitution has adopted the principles of fair trial and proceedings in order to ensure and give us a just society where every need and any and every uh, accused must have uh, a fair chance of fighting and defending themselves so with that i would uh, uh, say thank you and uh, please keep yourself away from uh, these public debates and developing your opinions according to them thanks thank you very much
thank you so much sir for sharing the words of wisdom with us uh, it's you also extended the topic to uh, the bail matters that exactly where the public discourse does matter sometime that where the matter should be decided it does not decide that way and you also maintain that how difficult it's to maintain the fair trial in public discourse cases while maintaining the dignity of the office of the president and at the same time being the defense counsel so thank you so much uh, sir now i would like to uh, invite uh, ms rebecca john senior advocate high court of delhi to uh, share with us wisdom and experience ma'am thank you uh, justice kurin joseph uh, mr mohit mathur dr nagadatna pavan and my dear friends thank you very much for inviting me to this platform uh, you have asked me to talk basically about victimization of the accused and victims and the impact of public discourse on uh, accused persons and victims of uh, of uh, of various crimes so my my address will be largely centered around that uh, criminal trials often invite media clamor and attention where the outcome of the trial is prejudged and the guilt or innocence of the accused is declared in mass media a single narrative takes over the public imagination and first principles such as innocent until proven guilty are all but forgotten uh initial media attention can be brutal and unforgiving detracting from the facts and evidence before the court a series of headlines help illustrate this idea in the dalgar case the hindustan times reported that the killer wore, gro- wore gloves and look at the headlines arushi murder killer wore gloves to avoid leaving fingerprints uh likewise in another headline by the times of india of 24th of april 2011 it said only parents could have killed arushi in the case that came to be known as the nirbhaya gang rape a narrative was created that the juvenile accused of the case was the most brutal the hindustan times reported delhi rape juvenile raped woman twice and ripped off her intestine in another headline uh, it the pioneer carried the story most brutal late rapist of nirbhaya let loose In the Tuji case, a media frenzy was whipped up against the accused. Z News reported a Raja made three thousand crores in bribes. The much-talked-about Tuji Spectrum allocation scam, which not only caused an estimated loss of one point seven seven lakh crores to the state exchequer, but also made former Telecom Minister Raja richer by some three thousand crores. Now look at these headlines. In the Talwar case, none of the headlines were proved. in fact the alabad high court acquitted them in the delhi gang rape case the juvenile justice board took some extra time to explain after assessing the evidence that the narrative that the juvenile was the most brutal was in fact wrong and after assessing the evidence they came to the conclusion that there was nothing to suggest that the juvenile was the most brutal in the 2g spectrum case the trial court acquitted all the accused on the ground that the prosecution was unable to prove that there was any kind of loss much less any uh, any bribes that the principal accused may have taken as was suggested by the media earlier now the prejudicial nature of these headlines and the media frenzy that was whipped up in these cases was unfortunate in time some cases in some of these cases there was some restoration of the level playing field due to the passage of time and the short shelf life of media attention but let me examine some more cases in particular the butler house in encounter case in what came to be known as a butler house encounter case a leading news news magazine in delhi india today carried a full cover story with confessions of the accused persons while they were in police custody along with their photographs as you know such statements are inadmissible in evidence and the entire purpose of carrying these confessional statements recorded in police custody was to add prejudice a layer of prejudice against these accused persons very dramatically the cover story carried the headline inside the mind of a bomber moving away from these cases i will now look at the telangana rape case where public discourse in the media narrative failed both the victim of the crime as well as the accused persons here is a brief chronology of events 
On 27 November 2019, a veterinary doctor left her clinic situated at Gachiboli on the outskirts of Hyderabad. On the morning of 28th November 2019, the Hyderabad police recovered a burned body from an underpass near Chatanpalli on the Hyderabad Bangalore Highway, nearly 25 kilometers from her last known destination. On 29th November 2019, the police arrested four lorry drivers and cleaners between the ages of 20 to 24 for the offenses of gang rape and murder. High voltage public outrage followed and three policemen were suspended for the de delay in the registration of the FIR. On 4th December, the police sought and were granted seven days police custody remand by the first additional district and sessions judge court in Mehbubnagar for the purpose of interrogating the accused persons. In the meantime, their names and photographs were flashed across digital and print media. Public opinion had already pronounced them guilty. On the morning of 6th December 2019, the country woke up to the news that all the four accused had been killed in an encounter under a bridge on the Bangalore Hyderabad National Highway while they were still in police custody, triggering a chorus of praise for the Hyderabad police, as many saw it as speedy justice. So many questions needed to be answered. The failure of effective policing that allowed an incident of this nature to take place, the failure of prompt police action to screen and scan the area of crime on the night of 27th of November 2019, and the lack of utter sensitivity shown to the family members of the veterinary doctor who had sought to lodge a prompt FIR. But by not sending the men who were arrested and accused of the crime for trial, and by not allowing the evidence collected against them to be tested in a court of law, the Hyderabad police also failed the victim. It is now impossible for anyone to conclusively establish that the men the police chose to arrest and demonize were the men who had actually committed the crime. What about the men themselves? Is it possible that they were innocent? Is it possible that they were killed uh, in this brutal fashion only to avoid the evidence collected against them to be scrutinized by a court of law? Is it such an impossible scenario for us to imagine? So at both levels, this case represents the failure of justice, both from the point of view of a victim and the point of view of the accused persons. Another case that I'd like to highlight is the Ryan International School case. The clamor for instant arrest and immediate punishment often leads to gross miscarriage of justice. Let us recall what happened in this case on the 8th of September 2017 at Ryan International School, Gurgaon. Tragically, a student of class two was found murdered in the washroom of the school at 8 a.m. By midday, the police had zeroed in on the suspect, a poor bus conductor of the school. All sorts of stories were circulated. The Gurgaon Bar Association passed a resolution that they would not defend the bus conductor. But the father of the victim was dissatisfied with the investigation and the case was eventually transferred by the Supreme Court to the CBI. In a remarkable turn of events, on the 8th of November 2017, the CBI arrested a class 11 student of the school and exonerated the bus conductor. The open and shut case was opened again. It was now time for a different narrative. Demonizing and condemning people seems to have become a bit of a habit with us. You have also asked me to indicate how uh, victimize, how the impact of public discourses have a, have a negative impact on a victim. And this is seen most uh, emphatically in cases relating to sexual offenses. Uh, I will, uh, as it is, it, it's now been highlighted in, in several portals, uh, I will quote from the recent judgment of the Karnataka High Court in its order dated 22nd of June 2020, granting anticipatory bail to a rape accused. I have no difficulty when courts grant bail, whether to a rape accused or to anyone else. If the facts of the case justify that bail should be granted, it must be granted. Indeed, if it's not granted, then that is a travesty, a travesty of justice. But when courts exceed the examination of evidence and make comments like the following, it becomes a little problematic. What did the Karnataka High Court say? And I quote, the explanation offered by the complainant that after the perpetration of the act, she was tired and fell asleep 
is unbecoming of an Indian woman. That is not the way our women react when they are ravished. Quite apart from the very strange and problematic language used, this was no part of the duty of the court to pass comments on the character of a woman complainant. In another case, Mehmood Faruqi was a state where the Delhi High Court passed its judgment on 25th September 2017. Uh, it made some interesting observations. Instances of women behavior are unknown, are not unknown, that a feeble no may mean a yes. If parties are strangers, the same theories may not be applied. If parties are in some kind of prohibited relationship, then also it would be difficult to lay down a general principle that an emphatic no would only communicate the intention of the other party. Now, societal rage is unproductive if it does not force us to think beyond individual cases and confront the troubling roots of sexual violence that are deeply embedded in our society. There seems to be a handbook of behavior applicable to women that none of us have access to. Perhaps they only remain in judges' libraries. Uh, but this comes from a deeply patriarchal mindset that is unable to give any agency to women, particularly in, sexual, in, in the context of sexual, sexual crimes and while examining their evidence in court. It is not my case that every woman who claims that she was sexually assaulted must be believed. It is not my case that every case of rape must end in conviction. On the contrary, it is my case that every case must be examined on its merits and depending on the merits of the case, uh, of the final adjudication of innocence or guilt must be pronounced. But it is also my case that women must not face this kind of backlash, either from society or from courts. It takes a lot for women to complain. And when women are told that it is unnatural behavior that they get off to sleep, and it is not behavior of the normal Indian women, or that it is not the behavior of a rape victim that she, uh, that, that she, uh, uh, that she combs her hair or, or, or tries to act normal after, the, after, the, uh, the, the, after she has been raped, then you are actually give, giving in to that patriarchal mindset that we have fought so hard against. And therefore, victims in the criminal justice system, particularly victims of sexual assault, face this kind of backlash very often. Contrast this reasoning with what we deal with cases of privilege. The denial of fair trial is as much an injustice to an accused as it is injustice to the victim and society as a whole. In an unequal society, public outrage e easily targets the poor and the, up and the oppressed. Cheerleaders of vigilantism are notably muted where evidence points towards involvement, complicity, and possible guilt of men belonging to privileged sections of society. Let me highlight a case of privilege. This is the iconic Nanavati case, uh, which, which captured the imagination of the Indian public, particularly people in and around Bombay in the 60s. Ever wondered why the Nanavati trial captured so much attention? Let me give you some reasons. One, the accused was a young, handsome naval officer. Two, he was seen to have been wronged by his wife and her lover. Three, his act to murder was justified as he was provoked by his wife's lover. The tabloid Bliss eulogized his act as a loving and wronged husband, avenging the wrongdoing against him by his deviant wife and her playboy lover. Bachi Karkaria wrote in the BBC that, and I quote, his high profile trial captured public imagination, swooning women through lipstick uh, uh, kissed currency notes as a naval officer moved into court. The jury acquitted him. But the Bombay High Court overturned the jury decision. The governor then suspended his sentence. The Supreme Court held that the governor had overreached his power and struck down his suspension of sentence. Nanavati spent three years in jail and he was thereafter pardoned by the governor of the new state of Maharashtra. I wonder sometimes whether Nanavati would have got the same treatment had he not belonged to the class that he belonged to. And whether 
an ordinary person in the same, in the same state of Maharashtra, perhaps from a poorer section of society, would have received such largesse from the state. Look at other cases where privilege and entitlement results in a certain kind of treatment. The lynching cases in Jharkhand, 11 men convicted and sentenced for life for lynching a cattle trader, Alimuddin Ansari. He is then, their, their sentence is then suspended and they are released by the High Court. A high-ranking public servant goes and garlands them once they are released. This attracted a fair degree of media flack. Take the case of Bilkis Banu. Bilkis Banu fell victim to a carnage unleashed by a mob during the 2002 riots. Her three-year-old daughter was taken from her hands and her head smashed against the rock. All her female relatives were raped and killed. Bilkis herself, who was only 19 at the time, was pregnant and was gang raped. She tried to get an FIR record at the same day, but it was not properly recorded. The FIR did not record that she was raped, and despite her telling the names of the accused persons, it did not record the same. The police grew, uh, the police grew alarmed when some photographs discovered the dead bodies of the relatives of Bilkis, including her three-year-old daughter. The doctors gave wrong medical opinions, did not preserve any blood or biological samples, and the police decapitated the bodies, sprinkling salt to them, and buried them in unmarked graves. Finally, the case was transferred to the CBI. Eventually, before the transfer of the case, the police filed a closure report, which was first not accepted, but a second closure report was accepted. Bilkis approached the Supreme Court challenging this closure and seeking a transfer of the investigation to the CBI, which was allowed. Charge sheets were filed against 20 persons in 2004. In August 2004, the Supreme Court ordered the transfer of the trial of the case to Gujarat, from Gujarat to Maharashtra. In January 2008, the trial court convicted all the persons who had perpetrated the rape and even the constable on duty who had deliberately recorded the FIR incorrectly. It, however, did not convict the policemen and doctors complicit in the cover-up. The Bombay High Court in its judgment dated uh, upheld the conviction of the rapists and even convicted the policemen and doctors. Observing the role played by policemen and doctors, it was observed, in this case, the truth and falsehood are mixed up in such a manner that at every stage of the evidence, the truth is hidden under layers of intentional laxity, omissions, contradictions, falsehoods, and the truth is required to be unheard. In April 2019, the Supreme Court directed the government of Gujarat to pay 50 lakhs as compensation to Bilkis. As we speak, another case of custodial torture and death is being investigated in Tamil Nadu, in Tutukorin, where a father and son Jew were arrested for a simple accusation that they had kept their shop open beyond the 7 p.m. curfew. Both father and son were taken to the police station, remanded to police custody, tortured sexually and otherwise, and then found dead. There's been outrage uh, of this action. Uh, this action, this action. In. I've also been asked to speak on the gender law. The principle on gender law, which is was uh, enunciated in the like Supreme Court. Mahinder Chavala versus Union of India, 2019, Volume 14, SCC 615. And the key principles enunciated were as follows. Witnesses are important players of the judicial system who help the judges in arriving at correct factual findings. Because of lack of witness protection program in India, the treatment that is meted out to them, there is a tendency of reluctance in coming forward and making statements and testifying in court. Quoting Zahira Habibullah Sheikh's judgment, witnesses are the ears and eyes of the court. The state's role's role in protecting witnesses is very crucial. They turn hostile because of threat, inducement, use of stock witnesses, etc. A witness protection scheme in 2018 was enacted where several categories of witnesses were highlighted and threat per perceptions against them was also highlighted. Coming from Delhi, it is my duty to say 
that there are witness, vulnerable witness deposition complex, complexes established in different courts in Delhi. And the witness protection scheme of 2018 provides for usage of specially designed court, courtrooms having special arrangements like live links, one-way mirrors and screens, apart from uh, separate passages for witnesses and accused with the option to modify the image of the face of the witness and to modify the audio feed of the witness's voice so that he or she is not identified. There are also special laws with respect to protection of victims in cases of, uh, of sexual assault. Uh, this is there in the Criminal Law Amendment Act of, of, of 2013. And likewise, even before the amendments came into place, in the judgment of the Supreme Court in Sakshi versus Union of India, the Supreme Court talked of protection of witnesses, especially witnesses who are uh, victims of sexual assault. In the end, we must remember that an accused person has lost his liberty and is facing a trial. He is entitled to be presumed innocent till a court proves him guilty. He is entitled to a fair and just trial. The prosecution is only one side of a litigation. There must be level playing field. It is the prosecution which must prove its case beyond reasonable doubt, never the accused. And these principles must never be compromised with. It is not the duty of courts to send messages to society. In fact, that would not aid the cause of self-correction. As we saw in the judgment of the Supreme Court in Ankush Maruti Shinde's case, where men on death row who had been incarcerated for 16 years, uh, during review arguments, the Supreme Court overturned their conviction and their sentence and came to the conclusion that these men, nomadic tribe, part of a nomadic tribe of, of Maharashtra, were completely innocent of their crime. I will end with a judgment that Justice Kurian Joseph passed on the eve of his retirement, Chanulal Verma versus State of Chhattisgarh. And I will particularly refer to para 25 of this judgment. This was also a death penalty case. And these uh, words uh, that Justice Kurian Joseph penned is very, very important in the context of what we are facing today. And I quote, it is also a matter of anguishing concern as to how public discourse on crimes have an impact on the trial, conviction, and sentence in a case. The court's duty to be constitutionally correct, even when its view is counter-majoritarian, is also a factor which should weigh with the court when it deals with the collective conscience of the people or public opinion. After all, the society's perspective is generally formed by the emotionally charged narratives. Such narratives need not necessarily be legally correct, properly informed, or procedurally proper. As stated in report number 262 of the Law Commission of India, the court plays a counter-majoritarian role in protecting individual rights against majoritarian Im impulses. Public opinion in a given case may go against the values of the rule of law and constitutionalism by which the court is nonetheless bound. And as has been held by this court in Santosh Bhariyar's case, public opinion or people's perception of a crime is neither an objective circumstance relating to crime nor the criminal. In this context, we must also express our concern on the legality and propriety of people engaging in a trial prior to the process of trial by the court. It has almost become a trend for the investigating agency to present their version and create a cloud in the collective conscience of society regarding the crime and the criminal. This undoubtedly puts mounting pressure on the courts at all stages of trial, and certainly they have a tendency to interfere with the due course of justice." Unquote. And I think there can be no better way to end than this, this, this iconic paragraph from Chanulal Varma versus the State of Chhattisgarh's judgment, which Justice Kurin Joseph penned, uh, I think, on the eve of his retirement. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for covering the cases from uh, 1960 uh, to the recent uh, order passed by the Karnataka High Court. Almost all the important orders and the judgments have been covered, including the Chandulal uh, case passed, judgment passed by Justice Korean Joseph. Thank you so much for sharing with us your golden experience.
of dealing with all these cases where the public discourse is involved. Uh, now, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Nagaratna to give a few insight into the topic. Dr. Nagaratna. Yeah. Honorable Justice Korean Joseph, um, uh, Mr. Rebecca John, Mr. Mohit Mathur, Pavan, and dear friends. In fact, most of the points are already covered by uh, the other panelists, but I'll just add uh, to some of it uh, more as an academician, uh, based on my observation as an academician. And I'll just uh, break my talk into a few subtopics. So, majorly, like uh, the whole influence of public opinion and the public discourse. Uh, on the criminalization aspect is what I would want to uh, focus uh, a little on, uh, followed with its impact uh, in the entire criminal process, uh, including investigation, trial, and post-trial procedure. Uh, and also uh, on the parties, the accused, the witnesses, victims, as well as the society. So uh, usually the criminalization, uh, in fact, it is uh, uh, something that the state does unless the offenses are generally called as mala in se. So especially when we are declaring certain offenses as, as wrong, in the Latin term, it's usually referred to as mala prohibita. So that's when the state definitely considers the public opinion. So the social perception, the public opinion about the wrong is something that anyways influences the lawmaking process, especially at the stage of criminalization. And of recently, we've also seen how the public opinion can also lead to decriminalization. That may be because of the change in the society, the change in the perception of principle of morality. So overall, we've always seen that the public opinion has had its own impact in the criminalization as well as a decriminalization uh, process. Just to give a, few, give a few examples, recently we've seen how the Epidemic Diseases Act underwent change due to the ordinance which was passed by the government, which was more because of the cry for justice by medical fraternity. So definitely the public opinion has had its say in this lawmaking process. Similarly, we also saw how the Disha case led to certain state amendments in the rape law of Telangana. And the latest has also been the Consumer Protection Act, which was largely a civil law, but because of the cry for justice in relation to frauds committed on consumers, uh, the Consumer Protection Act is also undergoing a lot of changes, including uh, you know, those uh, provisions which will have a criminalization effect. So, and not just this, so even the opinion of the public, which is sometimes expressed formally, maybe this is what we've seen in Mathura rape case, where few law teachers wrote an open letter to the Supreme Court and that led to the amendment to the IPC. So from Mathura to Disha, we've, we've seen how the laws have undergone change because of public opinion. Yes, sometimes it has its own advantageous effects, while sometimes it, it can have its own advantageous effects. Um, so coming to the impact of public discourse uh, on investigation, already panelists have indicated the kind of negative impact this can have on uh, the entire process. But we've often seen how the investigating agency comes under a lot of pressure when there is public debate about an ongoing case which is under investigation. Uh, and many times there is cry for or transfer of case from one agency to another. And often we've seen how this public opinion has in fact led to transfer of case. Of recently we are seeing how even in Sushant Singh's uh, suicide case, when they are suicide or whatever case, there is a cry for uh, justice and there is a request for a transfer of case. Sometimes it might lead to transfer of case, but in, uh, and then this impact on the investigating agency can in fact also include a demotivating impact on those agencies. So that's something that is usually not taken note of in the entire process. We've also seen how the cry for justice has led to many other disadvantages like uh, 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 the pub, uh, like the public outrage where accused gets attacked, which we unfortunately saw in Arushi murder case, many terrorism cases, or even in Disha case, which led to encounter. So on one hand, there is public outrage, and on the other hand, especially cases like uh, encounter and all those uh, investigating officers suddenly are made public heroes. So this is also another impact that I've seen on the cases. Uh, and then, uh, however, there is sometimes a positive effect also that we can see like uh, this entire cry for justice from the public impact led to uh, the uh, uh, advantageous effect that we saw to an extent at least uh, in Jessica Lal case, Priya Dashini Matu case, cases that probably would have been some other you know, conclusion you know, got uh, impacted because of uh, public opinion. Uh, and uh, 
and uh, giving certain examples from the state of Karnataka, so the DK Ravi case, an IAS officer committed suicide, despite the case finding a closure, a formal closure from the investigating agency, even today it is perceived to be a case of murder. So many times there is reluctance from the public in accepting the uh, uh, opinion of the uh, 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 machineries that administer justice. So even now, whenever there is a case of suicide of an officer, it gets related to cases like DK Ravi. In fact, like uh, just few days back, we also had another suicide of a IS uh, officer who was named in INA scam case. This will also help us to understand the kind of impact that the accused might face because of public discourse. So we've seen like increase in the number of suicides also happening, especially in cases where it's high profile case and an accused is named. Today, the whole issue becomes more complicated because of the interface between the uh, platform of like, uh, information and the social media. So everything that is said today gets reflected on social media, thereby also having its own impact on the machinery that administers criminal justice system. And uh, another impact that I have noticed is the breach of privacy and the confidentiality of the parties who are involved. It can include the witness, it can include the victims, uh, it can include other stakeholders who are involved in the entire process, sometimes also raising the concern of safe, safe security and safety of these parties who are involved. So, in fact, most of this would also affect uh, the entire investigation process because this builds in uh, pressure tactics upon the investigating agency, thereby affecting a scientific investigation. And many times you've seen how every move of investigating agencies captured by the media, including of recently the social media, photographs, reports of investigating agency gets informally shared on social media. And uh, the other impact of this on the investigating agencies that over there we see that there's a zeal to overdo the thing from the investigating agencies. So, the, uh, and then there is a hurried mess in the process. And uh, uh, this can also definitely uh, lead to uh, unfair procedure. Uh, the influence on the trial and the other judicial proceedings, including inquiry, again, is something that other panelists have already mentioned. Just to give a few more examples, in a highway murder case in Karnataka, in fact, uh, when a, a, a case was heard in the first half of the day, by afternoon, a pamphlet was, uh, pamphlets were shared in the court premises saying that the judge is already, judge belongs to the same community as that of the accused. And because of that, by afternoon, uh, the judge had to uh, get himself relief from the case saying it's not before me. So sometimes you've seen how this public comments or at least the comments made by some members of the public has affected the judicial process. And of recently we've seen like more than 15 judges saying that they don't want to hear a case in relation to an alleged rape uh, offense against Swami Radhavendra Bharati case. So um, you know most of the judges are quoting that parties have no confidence in the court so they are, I wouldn't want to continue with this case. So this is another impact that we've seen on the trial process. And um, again, as uh, earlier panelists have mentioned, uh, like judge also, like any other human being, can also get influenced with what gets debated in the public domain. And there's something that was told even by Justice Benjamin Cardozo in his book on due process, uh, in his book on due judicial process. I quote, uh, perhaps the most uh, important contribution is the judge's recognition of the subconscious element. Deep below consciousness are other forces like the likes and the dislikes, the predilections, the prejudices, the complex of instincts and emotions and habits and convictions which make the man, whether he is a litigant or a judge. So therefore, it's a fact that even a judge can get influenced with these kind of debate that happens on uh, social media or otherwise uh, in form of public uh, discourse. And with all this, what we're losing sometimes, at least in some cases, is the judicial application of mind, which gets affected because this can lead to a, a possible bias in the judicial approach. As uh, Ms. Rebecca was mentioning, bail application sometimes gets decided based on what public perceives as. So this can have its own impact on various procedure uh, of criminal process, including uh, bail uh, applications and decisions. Post-trial, again, I'll take an example that Ms. Rebecca was mentioning, Nanavati case and many other cases, you've seen how there's been a pre-term release, maybe by the executive uh, wing of the state. But many times the reason for this pre-term release has been the opinion of the public in favor of the uh, convict. Uh, so therefore, post-trial also it will have its own impact. Um, and also uh, the manner in which an inmate is treated in the custody or the manner in which he's been treated otherwise in the society, uh, especially, uh, again, uh, the public outrage against the convicts and all. And in, in fact, in um, 
uh, Nirbhaya case, we saw how inmates uh, attacked uh, the accused and all. So this is also because of the opinion that is uh, influenced because of public discourse. Uh, so uh, and then. Uh, the impact of this entire public discourse on the parties also cannot be ruled out, as I just mentioned. Accused may also receive it uh, 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 from his end, for example, the manner in which he gets treated in the custody gets many times determined by this. The manner in which he gets treated by the prison officers may also be because of the influence of public discourse. And also, like uh, what we saw in uh, 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 Talwar case, the uh, uh, attack on the accused by uh, uh, the members, uh, one of the members of the public. Uh, and today, in fact, because of uh, the uh, 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 exchange of this kind of information on social media, it has also led to mob violence, mob lynching, etc. Very recently, Supreme Court has taken note of this and has asked intermediaries to be more responsible on you know, uh, filtering these kind of contents. But that's but uh, you know, the reality is it's uh, next to impossible that you can filter the news on social media. And also the impact on the witness. We had one case in Kanaka a few years back called Dandu Palya case. So uh, the manner in which this case was debated in the media was such that no witness was willing to come before the court to depose. Because that was the extent of fear which was, in, which was uh, you know, caused in the mind of the witnesses. So this definitely raises the concerns of security and safety of the witness. As this, at the same time, many times we've seen how a witness will also turn hostile. So, um, and then the impact on the victim, the privacy concerns, the pressure on the victim, uh, and then uh, the impact on the society. So, a cry for justice you know, sometimes gets misled because of this kind of public uh, 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 debate. Um, and then what we saw of recently when uh, the Nirbhaya case convicts were uh, getting subject uh, sentenced with a death sentence, we saw outside uh, the prison public celebration. So this entire you know, notion of uh, justice leading to glorification of uh, uh, things that are done uh, outside the court premises as well as things that becomes a part of criminal procedure cannot be moved out. So the influence definitely has its own say. Uh, many times we've seen how this can also affect certain category of cases like cyber crimes. Very briefly about uh, this category of cases since I uh, 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 work more in the cyber law domain. Uh, so since it's perceived to be a very technical, very complicated case and also because of lack of conviction. So there's huge pressure that we've always seen, you know, that uh, uh, comes from the investigating agency. So since it's a techno legal offense, so getting conviction definitely is next to a great difficulty or a huge challenge. So because of this, what we've seen is there is a shift in the uh, way in which the uh, cyber police is today functioning. For example, initially, most of the cases which they felt couldn't lead to convictions. So they started encouraging com uh, the uh, an outside court settlement of the uh, offenses. In fact, in 2008, when the law underwent change, the information technology had underwent change, they formally allowed compounding of offense. So what we saw in this uh, kind of case is that uh, we are allowing the parties to settle the matter mainly because you don't foresee many large number of convictions. And also simultaneously, these ethical hackers as an important stakeholder have also emerged because of the opinion or perception that the regular investigating agencies cannot do a better job when it comes to cybercrime investigation. And just last week, the ministry has come up with a list of cyber uh, technology experts who can, in fact, assist investigating agency. That can be, in fact, an example of an uh, advantageous effect. But this is all because of the perception of the stakeholders involved in the domain as well as sometimes the public. And then the intermediary response. So in 2005, when Supreme Court says that the intermediary need not have to uh, uh, block internet or need not have to share all the information with the police. So uh, then the perception was that uh, uh, these might affect right to privacy, freedom of speech and expression, etc. But because of the increase in the number of uh, uh, cases relating to abusive contents online, etc., especially in the context of cases that involved online streaming of rape videos or uh, such abusive contents that got shared on WhatsApp kind of platform, of recently we've seen how the Supreme Court itself has changed that, asking the intermediaries to be more responsive. So, and uh, that has, anyways, fortunately led to a change in the trend. So now we see that the 
internet service providers have been more responsive in terms of technical measures they've taken, in terms of coordination that they provide to the police. The other change that I've noticed is uh, with regard to online financial fraud. The whole focus of investigating agencies today has shifted from punitive to remedial. So instead of investigating and finding who the accused is, especially in online financial frauds, they started uh, trying to get remedy to the victim by way of just getting the money transferred to the victim when I lose money. Uh, so earlier, this was not the focus of the criminal justice system. Focus was more on finding the accused and uh, it was more punitive in nature. But today we see that it's almost become like a civil ca case kind of a, a, a nature. That's because of the perception that you, know, you don't have many number of convictions or it's you know, uh, extremely technical in nature. Uh, and the other uh, uh, serious concern has been the way these kind of uh, uh, cases gets debated on social media and not just social media, even on electronic media. In fact, the reality today is that the most entertaining channels have, are the news channels and the most entertaining programs are the crime reports. So, uh, uh, and that in fact uh, helps us to realize the fact that you know, media is playing a very, very important role when it comes to this entire thing. So this entire uh, issue. So media trials, despite so many uh, uh, warnings by the courts, etc. In fact, in Arushi murder case, you did have stay orders asking media not to report about case. So, and, and despite having lost the contempt of court, etc., we see that many times they, you know, cross that, you know, uh, permissible, uh, you know, uh, limits of the law and start debating about a case that is subjudice. And unfortunately, sometimes we see that the uh, professionals involved in the entire process, including lawyers, become a party to this kind of debate. Uh, yes, the coverage of all these issues on media, including social media, is important, but the coverage should be in a non-obstructive or in a non-obstructive manner. Uh, but uh, definitely not in a manner that can distract or otherwise adversely affect the legal process. Uh, so therefore, we need a, we need to relook at the ethical codes that binds these uh, you know, uh, mass media, electronic media, and other you know, uh, media, including the press. And we also probably require some form of say, guidelines or ethical codes for social media. Uh, especially the kind of news that gets shared if he's affecting directly a case that is undergoing. So maybe some sort of restrictive orders you know, should be in place. And uh, especially when lawyers, whether they are a party to the case or whether they're uh, involved in a case or not, you know, uh, so their ethical code uh, also, as of now, only requires you not to do uh, say anything that will affect uh, the uh, duty towards your client in duty, including confidentiality. So there's certain parameters set through bar council's code, but that is not enough. For example, if you compare it with American bar uh, code, it's more uh, you know, clear when it comes to these kind of debates in which lawyers involved. So they require lawyers not to make any public extrajudicial statement. So maybe it's the time for us also to have a relook at the ethical code that the professionals are bound by, including sometimes uh, the uh, uh, lawyers uh, and the other stakeholders. Uh, so communication of investigating agency with the public also should come under certain restrictions. Uh, so yes, in a democratic country, you need transparency in the criminal justice system, but then at the same time, we need to balance the two conflicting interests. So one is that of the actual need for justice, the actual need of a set procedure uh, that is required to achieve justice, and on the other hand, the transparency. Uh, public opinion definitely is important, but that can be taken at appropriate stage in uh, in appropriate manner. For example, public comments anyways, of, uh, we see that it's invited when laws are being made, laws are amended. For example, privacy uh, law, uh, in fact, is the result of Justice Krishna Committee, you know, which in fact had a lot of public discourse at different uh, parts of the country, different levels, etc. Public opinion does matter, but it should be taken at appropriate stage. Similarly, individual opinion of those victims also matter. So maybe what's happening in the Western country, like victim impact assessment. So that's when you need to collect the opinion of each party but not through the media. So especially when the parties involved in the case go to the media. So that's when we see that there's a diversion in the entire process. So in the entire thing, I think we should just judge based on one testing principle. That's about fairness of trial, which again, other panelists have already uh, discussed about. And this fairness of trial requires us to balance two important things. One is the openness in the trial, which anyway, CRPC also through various provision, you know, uh, ensures that it is uh, complied with. At the same time, certain cases, you need to uh, take care of those sensitive issues involved in the case, including confidentiality matters, etc. So both needs to be uh, balanced. The court should adopt 
less disruptive method of proceedings, uh, including uh, you know sometimes uh, a change of venue may be a better option, which I've seen happening in some of the cases. But then today this might not be an actual remedy because uh, the whole debate is not just happening amongst the public; it gets reflected on social media, which has no geographical limitations or jurisdictional limits. So maybe at the end of the day, uh, through judiciary, what is the remedy? Is that yes, as long as the orders are speaking orders and uh, completely rely on evidence and shows that public opinion has not adversely impacted the judicial process, uh, maybe that's one of the safeguards that the judiciary can take. Um, and then uh, uh, maybe at the end, I would just want to say that yes, public opinion is important, but we need to take it at the appropriate stage in a appropriate manner, but definitely not in a way in which it would impact the ongoing process, thereby raising the questions about fairness of the trial. So uh, uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, you also covered uh, the impact of public discourse even in the investigative agencies and also about the positive impact of the public discourse on the fair trial, conviction, and sentence in the criminal cases. Uh, thank you so much. Now, uh, I would like to invite uh, Honorable Justice uh, Kurian Joseph to share with us the experience and the words of wisdom. Thank you. Topic. Thank you. Thank you, Bhavan. Uh, my esteemed uh, friend uh, Govind Mathur. Has Mr. Mathur gone? Yeah. He's here. Yeah, I I'm am. Here, I'm here. Uh, Mohit Mathur. In fact, I remembered my colleague, I'm sorry, my, my elder brother Govind Mathur. Mohit Mathur. Yes. I wish you reached that Govind Mathur's place also. Yes. Sir, he's a relative of ours. Ah, that's one of my uncles, yeah. Ah, good. Okay. Yeah, I was just thinking about him only when I saw your surname. Dear uh, Rebecca, Dr. Um, Nangaratna, and my dear um, uh, professors, uh, my friends in the fraternity, and students. Uh, Mathur, you, re you referred to Vox Populi. You know where this Vox Populi come from? That's uh, history of 2020 years back and when Jesus Christ was tried before Pontius Pilate. He was convinced that there is he is innocent. But the people cried, hang him. Just as you know, the cry, outcry that was going on, I just saw a chat uh, on Nirbaya. When the trial of Nirbhaya was uh, taking was going on in the in, in the in the court here in Delhi, outside there was a public demonstration that you know, nothing short of capital punishment should be awarded. So when I speak to judicial officers in National Judicial Academy in Bhopal, I used to tell them if that judge had not uh, prescribed capital punishment uh, uh, had, had not uh, uh, awarded capital punishment, probably the people would have. <laughs> imposed capital punishment on the judge. That was the type of pressure that was mounting on when the trial was going on. So that was Vox Populi. So finally, final Pontius Pilate said, no, I know he's innocent, but I'm just washing my hand because people are against you. So I surrender to people's will. So go and uh, take him for capital punishment. That is the Vox Populi that came from that uh, uh, era only, 2020 years back. And when you mentioned about uh, the bail, impact on bail, I think one category of people you mentioned, you, you probably you left out, that is a high profile person. In the matter of uh, <laughs> dealing with the bail of high profile personnel, the way the media would like to uh, build up a case for or against the bail is something, something which uh, uh, worth noting. I leave it at that. And uh, you know, this uh, life and liberty, Article 21, just take it from the constitutional perspective. Life and liberty, you know, between life and liberty, many, many, many people have told between life and liberty, I give more importance to liberty. That is some people who fought for our freedom, they also said, I we value a lot of uh, what you call poetry are coming, a lot of slogans are coming, Lot of you know the, the public opinion have been molded, you know, which uh, given a, a particular impetus to the freedom movement. Let's have liberty first, and then think about our life. 
So between life and liberty, Indian constitutional uh, concept or constitutional jurisprudence has always been leaning in favor of uh, liberty because liberty is such a sacrosanct right under the constitutional scheme of our um, country. And uh, you know, it is available to all persons. There are two articles under the fundamental rights, 14 and 21, irrespective of uh, being a citizen, it's available to all persons. So liberty is such a sacred right of a person. When we think about Bell jurisprudence, uh, you know, the, 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 what do you call the, the, the trained mind of a judge. We take our oath. We should be free from um, fear or favor, affection or ill will. Four things we discard. We have taken a pledge in the name of God or in the solemn oath, whatever it is, you know, that you know, we'll be free from all these four, four elements, fear, favor, affection, ill will. But unfortunately, I do not know. Uh, just as Rebecca quoted the Canada case also, there have been so many such cases coming from South uh, also, you know, where judges uh, uh, go an extra mile in their judgments and then, you know, um, yeah. Yes, I do not know how much I must say, yes. Examine and say so many things which are not actually required for the judgment, which are not uh, relevant for the case, and that uh, in fact uh, has affected the, the the what they call the, the 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 credibility of the judicial institution. The credibility is more important as far as uh, the the pe people say you no, know, because this this whole institution is built on the faith of the public. The moment it is shaken. Well, then the democracy is gone because the whole uh, the, 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 the foundation of democracy is an independent judiciary. The moment the independent judiciary goes, well, democracy also goes and the country also goes. Once there is no democracy, there is no country also. So I must uh, caution, since you are not taking the liberty to caution, I must take the liberty to caution that you know, every judicial officer, be it from the rank of a civil judge junior division to the top of uh, the office in the judiciary is the judge of the Supreme Court. And we should have a seasoned mind. Uh, we, we should know how to exercise our judicial restraint. And uh, we should also train our minds in such a way that you know, we should be disassociated with what we have read or seen. And left me as a person, I never, 18 years and eight months as a judge, I was never in the habit of reading papers before going to court. I was never in the habit of uh, looking at uh, TVs. I've never ever watched a TV discussion. No, I've never done that. 18 years and eight months, I was a judge from the High Court to Supreme Court. I never uh, uh, watched a public discourse on um, uh, how, how a case should progress. It's not for them to uh, guide the judiciary. It is for the judicial mind to see what is in front of them and what is available in court. Because it is such, a, it is only the, 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 the deity we see, a blind deity. What does it mean? That only means that, you know, it is blind in to that extent that, you know, its scale is so even. So blind uh, regarding the bias, blind on the, the power, blind on the position, blind on the wealth, blind on the, the caste, blind on the creed, blind on the, blind on the language, blind on what, it's all, the deity is blind. But the court should be so objectively transparent and to be seen as always transparent and objective and never ever subjective. How does a judge, uh, uh, what do you call, um, get into the judgment, his personal information or his personal bias, his or her. I'm saying this because it's not for the judge at all to use that platform to, to, to reflect on or to comment on the conduct of a person, even if he has a personal knowledge or con conduct of a particular human behavior. How is the judge, uh, uh, you know, so, 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 um, Conversant with the human con nobody is no nobody is uh, nobody is conversant and particularly for a judge, the judge is only concerned with the material before him and not about the philosophy. 
not about the physiology not about the biology not about the uh, anything else uh, human is all irrelevant he is only the if it is a trial judge yes he has to see the the body language of the witness that's very important because you know it will help him to assess the quality of uh, the evidence apart from that you know no judge is ever ever uh, called upon or is is, is uh, should i must say should uh, reflect on or comment on or base his judgment on the conduct normally of a human person conduct normally of a human society etc etc now let me just come back to the the uh, aspects on death penalty because i have been asked by pavan to reflect on that also see all this you know the, the public uh, dr uh, nagaratne has just touched on it also the way it was celebrated etc etc was there a, see look at the the people who have been subject to do death penalty in india is the public ever aware that they ever got a full uh, fledged fair trial trial is a process of administration of justice did they get a real justice was the, was, was was the several aspects of their conduct weighed in the background of their age their social economic educational cultural background all these have for reflections on the human conduct so if you are going by the public outcry and there's one other factor uh, um, uh, mathur in fact referred to it i will convict you go and get uh, acquittal anywhere somewhere else see the reason is you know see <laughs> under under our constitutional scheme the high court is has a power of superintendence over the trial courts in the state so the high court does not have any material before it the only material before it is actually the what is what they have read in the paper what they have seen in the tv about an incident and uh, if if a trial judge on the basis of the available material on record and the evidence before it appreciates the facts and applies the law and uh, 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 what they call pronounces uh, a judgment uh, in the given situation where the accused was entitled to acquittal suddenly the eyebrows of uh, the high court will raise oh. then the people will start accusing attribute attribute motives on the part there is one reason for a recusal but uh, in my uh, career uh, in my in my uh, service as a judge in the supreme court i said recusal is to not be casual no judge shall recuse from a case for the only reason that you know Uh, somebody has written a letter somebody has recusal shall not be taken as a, a lame excuse for recusing from your um, uh, from your solemn duty to discharge uh, uh, justice at uh, uh, administer justice and discharge your duty you should have cogent reasons if you are going to fear like this you know you can't be a judge because a judge is should be judge should be free from uh, fear favor affection or ill will so recusal is not a casual affair that's the that's different thing but i'm saying this you know trial judges will always you know if the two views are possible they will always they take the view of less convicting because you know if i acquit him i will be seen by the public in a different way because the public has already formed an opinion from the i just read a couple of lines from frank frankfurter since uh, there was a reference to america uh, i think rebecca's speech uh, frankfurter 1946 our judges are also human and we know better than did our forebears how powerful is the pull of the unconscious and how treacherous the rational process so the tra- even the rational process is so treacherous and he goes on says and since judges how are stalwart are human the delicate task of administering justice ought not to be made unduly difficult by irresponsible print at that time in 1946 only print media was available so the 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 impact that could uh, be there on the human mind of uh, an unseasoned judge i would like to uh, say like that unseasoned so the, the seasoning of that's how we have training academies is an ongoing training for people doing uh, discharging this function as a judge you know a judge should be in a person to be absolutely free from all these pressures and pulls 
the whole problem uh, starts you know uh, having said that you know i must also say this, this must be this must be this must be the the way the the, the what they call um, we have the it's is for the um, supreme court and the high courts to send such uh, good messages but having said that you know these things uh, uh, set a very bad example look at a situation where you know um, a school boy in 2010 he uh, was spotted a beard in one state and he was expelled from the school and then he brought that issue before the supreme court and one comment from a judge don't bring talibanizers and there was a public outcry the times of india published that news and then the judge uh, that the case was changed from that bench, uh, bench and um, it was dealt i don't want to go to the result of the case but i'm only saying this look at that jessica lal's case you know and all the uh, i don't know some one of you had appeared in that case yeah, i think you some of you had appeared in that case but you know all of them were uh, acquitted by the trial court because of a shoddy investigation what did the delhi high court do delhi high court even without waiting for anything else out of the pub, uh, um, uh, me, uh, see, see having seen the public outcry ordered a reinvestigation that was a very rare uh, 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 occasion where the high court rose up to the stage and then rest is uh, history well uh, dr anuradha uh, nagaratna referred to two cases priyadasni matu and uh, jessica lal nitish katara and bmw uh, since uh, bmw are also two cases you know the impact uh, of the, the 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 public opinion on the fair trial so we have something on fair trial conviction and sentencing and sentencing also you know the the ill informed public since rebecca read out from the last uh, paragraph 25 of the judgment chanulal's case i don't read it i was really perturbed with the way the ill informed public opinion has the effect of impacting the 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 mindset of a judge in awarding uh, sentence uh, or rather you know in finding of uh, guilt or in conviction also that's why i said you know i thought i, I must say for history that there is a problem like this you know let's not uh, uh, say there is nothing like that there is a problem like this but let us face let us address this issue and you know though the supreme court on couple of occasions in in uh, thought of uh, um, laying down certain media guidelines also but for in fact i come from kerala kerala uh, i think is the first state where uh, there were a couple of judgments the high court passed that you know where uh, the trial is going on nothing shall be published in the media on the ongoing trial because it has a tendency to interfere with the administration of justice but now on, on fair trial um, what do you call the the trial being public uh, fair being the trial being public etc so um, in a situation where the, the trial being public there is no such uh, issue but as far as uh, investigation is concerned the tendency in fact i'll read out from the um, uh, the rajendra singhwalas case uh, where um, the supreme court said there is a growing tendency among the investigating officers either police or the departments to inform the media even before the completion of investigations that they have caught a criminal or an offender such crude attempts to claim credit for imaginary investigational breakthroughs uh, should be cut even where a suspect surrenders or a person required for questioning voluntarily appears it is not uncommon for the investigating officers to represent to the media that the person was arrested with much effort after considerable investigation or a chase similarly when someone voluntarily declares the money he is carrying media is informed that the huge cash which was not declared was discovered by the vigilant investigations and through checking premature disclosures or leakage to the media in a pending investigation will not only jeopardize and impede for the investigation but many a time allow the real culprit to escape uh, from law that is uh, uh, 2009 8scc 106 and coming to our rk anand case uh, go without saying the name mathur referred to this case uh, many a time 
but uh, the court uh, supreme court said you know it would be a sad day for the court to employ the media for uh, setting its own house in order and media too would certainly not release the role of being the snoopers for the court however to insist that a report concerning a pending trial may be published published or a sting operation concerning a trial may be done only subject to the prior consent and permission of the court would tantamount to pre censorship of reporting of court proceedings and this would be plainly an infraction of the media's right of freedom of speech and expression guaranteed under article 191a and uh, that entity be again the impact of television and newspaper coverage on a person's reputation by creating a widespread perception of guilt regardless of any verdict in court of law during high publicity court cases the media are often accused of provoking an atmosphere of public hysteria akin to a lynch mob which not only makes a fair trial nearly impossible but means that regardless of the result of the trial in public perception the accused is already held guilty and would not be able to live the rest of their life without intense public scrutiny i have so many other quotations also from uh, many other cases but i don't want uh, your time to be taken up and i do have to go for another webinar by 7 o'clock i'm only saying we need to have a balanced approach in this in any case i am of the considered view that prior to the trial taking place there shall not be any publication of any material with regard to the the guilt or otherwise of a person by the uh, the, the investigating officers that is a tendency of creating a, an a, an opinion in the mind of the public that somebody is guilty when that person get a fair trial and as rightly said by the bigger it is actually from the point of view of uh, the victim also victim should also get an opportunity to see that the conviction or face a trial that you cannot take away so it is not from the accused point of view also not only from the accused point of view but from the point of view of the victim also that the accused should face a fair trial so there must be a law in place according to me that prior to uh, to me i feel from the the moment the trial starts it should be made public and it should be a, it should, the public should be in a position to view the trial and till the trial there shall not be any public opinion or any leakage of what the investigation had already taken place as far as a committee is concerned and when the trial takes place since it is made public my second opinion my second uh, observation or suggestion or request is that you know it shall not be discussed in public as to the merits and demerits it should be left to the court to take a call on what the evidence is there shall not be any public uh, discourse on what the trial is and uh, as rightly said by all the speakers after the conviction and sentence is over there can certainly be a fair amount of criticism on the merits of the case also then it's actually then it is a jurisprudence till such time it is not jurisprudence it is actually a, a, a motivated uh, discourse so uh, this is my strong appeal that the media should restrain itself from this uh, the, the investigating officers no the trial should be made public but no discussion um, when the trial takes place after this over you can have a fair discussion on that thank you very much uh, for listening to me uh, thank you so much sir thank you uh, so much sir for uh, sharing with us your accumulated knowledge in the present topic uh, and how a judge should be like the goddess of justice who does not see while deciding the case the religion race sex caste and place of birth thank you so much for uh, enlightening us with that uh, if there is any question sir, there are a few questions uh, i just would like to address uh, one question is to uh, mohit sir um, uh, mr nayan has asked that to promote greater transparency and mitigate any abuse of the procedure of law in the criminal justice system would it be fair to say that we need the indian police system to wear body cameras this is actually something very interesting and perhaps we'll have more police uh, getting prosecuted because uh, they will be stopped from their excesses and their ways and their third degree methods of investigation but since uh, 
this is something which has to be a part of the entire uh, uh, thing which has to be done if you have to overhaul the system then this is just one thing that you are talking it requires uh, checks and balances uh, all across so it's not just that uh, police will so what in case you have to talk of then don't talk of one thing you have to have an all across overall system overhauling where uh, then you your uh, transparency would be wider and uh, that it would encompass more things not simpliciter uh, what police is investigating i hope that yes suffices thank you thank you so much sir uh, there is one last question to there is one there is one last question to uh, rebecca ma'am that uh, what if there had not been there is a question in the chat box that what if there had been no uh, public discourse whether the fate of nirbhaya would have been changed or would it would have been the same so what does that question mean uh, the uh, uh, the actually the fate of nirbhaya was was determined by uh, by the men accused of the crime on the day when she was raped so brutally uh, but if you are asking about the fate of the case uh, let's not forget the fact uh, that trial court the high court the supreme court all convicted the accused persons uh, dismissed their review applications dismissed the curative petition what is justice at the end of the day justice to my mind was served when all of them were convicted not one of them came out for one single day uh, they did not they were not released from prison and they were unlikely to be released from prison even otherwise so if you're going to equate death penalty the yeah. courts adequately dealt with the case courts determined the punishment the courts held them all guilty uh, i don't think uh, there is any need to Uh, to view a certain kind of punishment, which is death penalty, as the only form of justice, then it will become very, very problematic. Thank you so much, ma'am. Since we are on the verge of ending this session, thus, uh, on behalf of New Judicial Education, uh, I would like to uh, thank respected Honorable Justice Kurian Joseph, uh, Mr. Mohit Mathur, Ms. Rebecca John, and Dr. Nagaratna for taking out time from their busy schedule and enriching us with their knowledge, wisdom, and experience. I also thank the audience for their question and participating in this webinar. I also thank Dr. Vinod Sharma for being the backbone of NEEV. I further thank the entire team of NEEV Judicial Education specifically for bringing such an impressive panel together. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pawan. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye, Rebecca. See ya. Yeah, thank you so much. And sorry, I just wanted to. I just had to give an introduction in another webinar also. I just went for a couple of minutes. I wish we had a more uh, fruitful, interactive session. Which, um, but uh, so much of inputs have come. That's something very interesting from the academics point of view. Two illustrious uh, uh, members of the bar, particularly the Pradhan, I must say, Mohit Mathur eh? and Rebecca, your mentor. One, well, thank you so much. You know, let's all hope and. um you know no, since so many so many students are also here think and stand up for a judiciary which is independent pure and uh, you know constitutionally framed thank you so much thank you all the best thank you sir thank you so much